Welcome! Uh, today we'll be speaking about pop art, which is one of the very first postmodern art movements, and I'll explain to you in a moment why it's postmodern. Um, but before we go there, I just want to speak about the geography of Western art up until this point. So, before World War I happened, most of the movements that we discussed, so I'm speaking about Baroque, Romanticism, Neoclassicism, all of those were happening in France. France was almost the capital of the art world for a very long time in a Western narrative. All right, then what happened was uh, World War I happened, and as we know, Dadaism, which started in 1916, slap bang in the middle of World War I, made the art capital move to Zurich. Okay, the reason why, Zurich, Switzerland, Switzerland was neutral. It was easier for artists to be removed from the actual atrocities of war and for them to voice their opinions uh, quite freely in this space. Um, remembering that Dadaism did start making moves towards America uh, during its reign, should I say, uh, before it almost, well, killed itself. You know, anti-art became an art movement and therefore it died. <laughs> All right, so then we get the pop art movement, and this happened in the 50s and 60s, but what led up to this was in the 20s and 30s, there was a rise in fascism in Europe. Um, for those of you who don't know, fascism is um, a dictatorship ruled. It's very hierarchical government. Um, it's completely opposed to democracy. And so generally what happens is that uh, a fascist government would start as with the ideal of being communist, but then essentially government would uh, seize all power and it would become completely fascist. All right, so this was happening and so we've got um, the Stalins of the world, the Hitlers of the world coming into power and therefore more artists are wanting to get away from this, okay? In combination with this, um, in the States, we have uh, Franklin Roosevelt in power and he's trying to prove that capitalism is the best venture for people to, or the best governing policy in, in a sense. So in 1934, he decided to create the PWAP, PWAP, okay, the Public Works of Art Project. And he funded 3,749 artists um, to create 15,663 artworks within the first four months of 1934. So this was quite a big deal because artists weren't used to being paid by government to create art. So this was like, wow, okay, let's go to America. We can actually get paid to do what we love. Um, and you can see by those numbers that they created quite extensively. The point being that it drew a lot of people to the States, okay, so not only were Americans discovering that there were so many artists within their own shores, but now international people were coming to the States, and so this made essentially New York, but America in general, the new capital of the art world. So remember this was happening in the 30s, so by the time the 50s and 60s happened, um, there was a great need or a great understanding of arts in America. Okay, so that you just needed to understand in terms of uh, historical background. The other thing is that when pop art happened, it actually started in Britain. So I want you to think of pop art, Britain and America, that's essentially where it was happening. But it started in Britain and why it happened there was because Britain was really like ravished after World War II. Um, the, yeah, everything had been bombed, it was a complete ruin, basically, um, and they were looking at America as the, the go-to. Remember, America actually lent a lot of other countries money during the war, and so they were getting paid more, so they had more money to freely expend on things, um, and one such thing was their media. So, film had replaced radio, all of a sudden, people were watching all these things on media, and it was so cool, and rock and roll was in, hippies were in, there were all these subcultures, America was the it place, um, consumerism was rife, it was um, the baby boomers, what happened was they replaced the silent generation before them, um, so silent generation was very much part of the depression of war, and then the baby boomers came about, and it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, 
and they just started spending their money. And so what happened was Britain was seeing this, um, and they also, in, in an attempt to save their economic um, hardship, they also started buying into this consumerist nature. And so as opposed to the silent generation where, say, for instance, you would buy something because it's longevity, now we're in the 60s and the 50s and things like uh, trends start happening okay so we're so used to it now oh, summer trends winter trends but this was very new at that stage so it was like oh wow I as a, a young adult and um, all of a sudden have finances available to me and I can buy something that's not going to last long because of the trend you know so an example would be like the mini skirt that was designed at this time and uh, the reason why I chose that as an example is also because of what was happening politically okay so we've got a lot of liberation movements um, we've got the waves of feminism happening we've got the civil rights movement in the states so there's a lot of rebellion but also this kind of freedom to just consume what you want and where you want and that informing your identity okay after world war ii uh, many European cities, including London, were severely destroyed. Ex-servicemen returned to their former jobs, primarily as factory workers, and were tasked with rebuilding an economy in tatters. A consumer culture followed that provided an escape to the new demands of work and a dreary landscape in ruins. So this consumerism was an escape. Post-war economic developments in Britain created cheap mass-produced goods. It also gave workers more free time to spend their money on consumer products. The post-war years therefore saw the rise of popular culture in Britain, which was influenced by American film stars and a new form of music called rock and roll. <laughs> this appeared extremely colourful to the people from war-torn London. Pop artists were inspired by all forms of media, television, comic books, magazines, print advertisements, films and music. Okay, um, We haven't covered abstract expressionism yet, but it was a response to the subjectivity of abstract expressionism. So just a reminder, if something is subjective, it's very much about the personal, okay? Objective is what pop art was going for. It wanted to kind of bring together high and lowbrow art. So things that we would have seen as very esteemed and valued, like your oil paintings and your sculptures, compared to things like advertisements and flyers that were seen as not even an art form. Even elevating craft to a level of fine art. Um, so that is one of the main things that make it a postmodern movement, is that it was elevating lowbrow art um, and taking the mundane, so say for instance a comic book, and turning it into a piece of fine art that could be exhibited in the Guggenheim, for example. Okay, it was a continuation of Dadaism, and it also revered the banal object in an attempt to question the elitism of the art world. So you'll remember from Dadaism, for example, Duchamp just exhibiting a urinal, Pop artists did the same. You'll see Andy Warhol using soup cans and creating an artwork out of that. So banal meaning something that doesn't really hold value, something odd, you know, just a, an object that has no specific meaning all of a sudden becomes an artwork. Okay, there was an anti-authoritarian zeitgeist that promoted sexual freedom, women's liberation, intellectual freedom, new career structures, etc. Um, the civil rights movement saw... Uh, sought equality for African Americans and a general air of rebellion and protest was felt. The economic prosperity of the 50s and 60s fueled consumerism. Um, like I said, television replaced radio, advertising was booming. Then we had the Cold War happening at the same time. So the Cold War promoted American patriotism as well as capitalist ideals. So in opposition to that, we've got the Soviet Union promoting um, communism. Okay, so the space race battle uh, saw the USSR and America reach new heights, literally, as they were competing to see who could achieve the next best feat. The 60s were characterized by pop stars, brand identities, scientific developments. If we think of the space race, remember that um, it was all about who's going to get the first man on the moon. So Russia got the first uh, dog on the moon, poor Laika, and then America won up them with the first man on the moon. This was broadcast internationally because America was all about freedom of speech, uh, being capitalist in nature, 
And so even things like the Jetsons, the, the, the cartoon that we grew up watching, it's a propaganda tool to promote capitalism and America's scientific advance. Okay. Um, a new youthful generation emerged that resisted military conscription and the conservatism, conservatism of their parents. Pop art appealed to this generation because it was affordable, fun, colorful, and it reflected their culture. This was the generation of baby boomers and Gen X, which followed the silent generation. And the baby boomers were mods, rockers, skinheads, and hippies. They had expendable money, fleeting tastes, and a strong disdain for tradition. That's my cat. <laughs> okay, say hello to the people. Hello, people. <laughs> okay, so like I said, pop art is all about consumerism, it's about spending money, it's about promoting lowbrow art, it's about capitalism, it's about um, freedom, liberation, all of these things. Okay, so the first artist we look at is British. His name is Richard Hamilton. Um, he was born into a working class family, so, um, you know, never one from a wealthy family. And basically, he dropped out of school at the age of 12 um, from when he started taking evening art classes. He was accepted into the Royal Academy at the age of 16, but his studies were cut short when the school had to close down during World War II. He was still too young to be enlisted, and so he spent his time drawing. A couple of years later, he was expelled from the newly opened Royal Academy. He was called up to do two years national service. And then he went on to attend classes at the Slade School of Art, which opened up many doors for him. And he met many other artists and became a former member of the independent group. This group was invited to a show titled This Is Tomorrow. And after this, his art career was really made. He, um, he taught at the same institute that had expelled him. And his success grew over the years until he passed away in 2011. So the first artwork we look at is titled just what makes today's home so different, so appealing. Okay, it was made in 1956, and this is the artwork that was showed at the This Is Tomorrow um, exhibition in London that really made his career. Um, you can see that there's a, it's a collage, so there's a lot of different things happening. Um, if you look at the artwork specifically, we've got the first thing that grabs our attention is the, the giant popsicle okay, that this macho man is holding. And on it literally says pop. And a lot of people say this is where the art movement might have been named, but also it comes from popular. Okay, so there is this, that's why we always start with this artwork when we speak about pop art. Um, you can see the influence of media here. Now remember, Hamilton is British. So this is the influence he's seeing from the States. He's seeing, for example, the, the ceiling of this artwork, oh, you can't see it in my example, but the ceiling is the moon, okay, speaking about the space race. Then we've got this young romance, this comic book strip that's been framed on the wall. In the background, we see theatres and what's screening, so film. On the TV, we see a film star. We've got this um, burlesque-looking lady uh, with her nipple caps showing that sexuality was being sold freely, or well, not sold freely, but there was a freedom. Um, you've got the typical 50s housewife going up the stairs uh, using a vacuum cleaner saying, ordinary cleaners reach only this far. Um, and she looks like she's advertising, okay? So advertisement is there. We've got a random tin of ham, okay? Which also shows um, like the beginning of fast foods. So again, a link to consumerism. You can just buy what you want when you want, okay? Um, at the bottom, we've got the a radio set that was replaced by TV. So you can see that the TV and the radio together are in communication. There's a newspaper in the left-hand corner. The, the furniture would have been called mod at the time, and it came from Scandinavian influence. So there's a lot happening. Uh, there's the, the car Ford crest there showing that people had the access to their own transportation. So this artwork is basically a synopsis of that period in time. If we look at the next artwork in your notes, that falls out of the pop art movement. So I don't want you to study that for the exam. However, you can see that if you read through it, it's just like a more contemporary version of what he was doing in the previous artwork. So you're not going to look at 
that artwork, which is just what is it that makes today's home so different. We're going to skip past that one. Okay, then we get to the very fascinating Andy Warhol. Um, he was born in Pittsburgh. His parents were Slovakian immigrants, and his surname was originally Warhola. As a child, he spent a lot of time at home due to a nervous disorder. It was during this time that he would listen to the radio and collect images of his favorite celebrities, such as Shirley Temple. His fascination with fame started at a young age. His career started in New York, where he was a successful magazine and ad illustrator. Whilst there, he started to create works that were being frequently exhibited. Um, he was successful enough to buy a factory in 1964 that he converted into a studio, which he called the Fame Factory. So you must understand property prices in New York are now and were then exorbitant. So he managed to buy an entire factory and he called it the Fame Factory. And this was kind of like a reason to have parties and he had a whole lot of celebrities come over there all the time. It was almost like a hub of cultural excitement. Um, it even features in the last Men in Black movie where Andy Warhol is characterized when they go back in time. Um, and that gives you a good idea in that film actually what the fame factory was all about. Um, yeah, here his success continued. He experimented with various media such as film, silk screening and painting. He died at the age of 58 due to complications after an operation on his gallbladder. Okay, so if we look at his works, um, silk screening is his main mode of creation. So if we think of silk screening, what it is, it's, it's making a screen with a print that you can reproduce countless times, okay? And the reason why this is important in his work is because he's speaking to that. He's speaking to consumerism, okay? The fact that, um, for instance, if you think of Duchamp, this is where the influence from Dadaism comes in, he's just drawing on a postcard of the Mona Lisa because you could just readily buy postcards of any famous artwork of that time. It's speaking about how we can just buy and buy and buy. So the first work we look at is the Marilyn series. So Marilyn Monroe was a famous celebrity at the time. Um, she was the archetypal female um, seductress. She's known for singing happy birthday to the president in that very seductive voice of hers. Um, she's known for her skirt blowing up and showing all the gentlemen her, her nether regions. Um, and so this work really is iconic. It's about every man's dream girl. Okay, and he created it using very many different colors and very many different prints of the same image over and over and over. Almost saying, you know, that everyone can buy a piece of her. So um, she resembles a man-made commodity. The printing process eliminates the personal signature of the artist even further. So the fact that he's printed this doesn't show like a brush stroke on his part. There's nothing that could say this is specifically a war hole. Anybody could create the same kind of thing, although he was the only one creating it. And if we see it now, we automatically go, oh, it's a war hole. Okay. Um, he did sign the back of his artworks, but from the front, there's nothing specifically that could give away the artist's hand per se. Okay. Um, and that, for that reason, it becomes almost abstract. Okay. Also because it's repeated. So... It's like we're seeing the same thing over and over again. Um, he specifically registered the artworks incorrectly. So what that means is, say for instance, I silkscreen the black color first, and then I want the yellow on top of her hair, for example. It doesn't line up exactly as it should, so it's off-printed on purpose to emphasize the printing process, to emphasize the mechanized way that we are going into the world now. Okay, the color begins to take on a seductive beauty in its own right. The contrast of photographic image and flat pictorial shapes increases the artificial feeling. And these methods dehumanize Marilyn, giving her a uniform sameness. She becomes a container for the idea of celebrity. Um, he accentuates the smudged grain that you would see in newsprint, for example. Um, the reject layout and uneven inking was also an emphasis of this. You see her printed so many times in print media. He wants to hide the artist's involvement. He reduced Marilyn Monroe to a series of images 
that we will merely glance at as if seen on a TV screen and not study like a painting. So a TV is morally numb and treats all events as spectacle. So that's the first work we look at and you can see the commodification of the celebrity. Uh, she becomes an object and not a person anymore. She becomes something that you could buy. Okay, an image to be repeated, to be consumed. All right, if we look at the next work, it's called The Last Supper, and in brackets, The Big C. It was made in 1987. So we can see that it emphasizes the big C, and the first thing we think is the big Christ, because there's an image of Jesus there. Uh, but the second thing, the big C was a nickname for cancer at the time okay and a lot of studies were being done um, cancer was kind of being discovered at this time so it was like this hush elephant in the room that we don't speak about the big C okay other things we see are the motorbike again explaining fast pace of life consumerism um, we see a price tag 699 I'll get into that in a moment uh, but it's also these images of Christ that are kind of unfinished. Uh, we assume that those are his disciples with him in one of the images. Okay, um, this was created months before his unexpected death. It's an image that shows various copies of Christ as seen in Da Vinci's The Last Supper. Uh, superimposed on motorbikes, logos, a price tag, and the title The Big C. He was brought up in a strict Catholic household and was said to have been religious for most of his life. In this artwork, he's commenting on the way that America turned religion into a consumerist marketing ploy. Okay, so it can be very quickly um, read in the wrong way. Okay, it reminds me very much of that artwork that a student created a couple years ago that made the news all over South Africa and he was almost cancelled for it because it was seen as derogatory towards religion. But it's important to note that we are looking at pop art. Pop art emphasizes consumerism. And religion was being sold as a consumerist item then. So that's what this artwork is about. It's about, um, you know, how there's still a lot of that at this point in time um, where, for instance, the, the doom priest who sprayed everyone with doom to get rid of Satan out of their lives and people bought into that okay so it's a naive buying into Christianity and not necessarily the actual morals that Christianity set out to portray so um, much like a major corporation would capitalize on the manipulation of the masses in order to sell an Americanized Christianity that was bigger and better than anywhere else in the world okay the use of motorcycles is a symbol of subculture of the time so we had the mods and the rockers. The mods would ride scooters like a Vespa and they would wear thin uh, ties and suits and the females were very androgynous but they would wear false eyelashes and the rockers were almost like more rebellious at the time. They would ride motorbikes and they would gel their hair into like um, mohawks and they would wear big leather jackets. So where the mods were kind of like um, what would I compare it to today? Um, hipsters, the rockers were almost like, uh, not goths, more like punks, okay. So the motorcycle really represented that rebellion of the time. Um, the price tag symbolizes the devaluing of religion. It could also refer to the devaluing of high art, such as da Vinci's works, due to mass production and copies. Okay, some critics have gone so far to say that when the 99 cents are mirrored, one would read the biblical apocalyptic number of 666. Um, okay, then I've re referred to the big C as Christ and or Catholicism, but people fearing cancer as well, so that would be the big C. Not only is Warhol calling attention to the commodification of religion, but to art too. Art at this point was being reproduced to a point where like his artwork, the art world seemed mechanized. One could buy a cheap copy of The Last Supper at a novelty store. In fact, he bought such a postcard at Times Square um, and it reminded him of his mother. So it's really about being able to just buy and copy, buy and copy, buy and copy. Um, and that's what we'll see when we look at um, green Coca-Cola bottles from 1962. So for him, Coca-Cola was... The 
absolute symbol of consumerism. Um, if we look at his Maryland series and his Campbell soup cans, uh, we see repetition. Okay, and here we see it again with 112, uh, some empty, some full Coca-Cola bottles lined up in a row. At the very bottom, we see the cadmium Coca-Cola logo that we all know and uh, we assume to be Coca-Cola. Even if we just saw one of those letters, we could identify that logo immediately. Um, they've been silk screened in black over a base layer of different sized green shapes. So what that means is he would literally first take the green color and plot all these bottles, silk screen that color. Then put the paper down again and then silk screen the black outlines on top of that. Okay. Um, the printing is purposefully off. Again, the register is off showing that the artist had a role to play in the decision making during production and it also shows the use of silk screening to make the process mechanized so art production became mechanized like the world that we were living in okay it's almost like today digital artists digitizing work you know maybe not even having a physical artwork to show but having something virtual you know that's really emphasizing where we are today so this would emphasize where they were then Okay, uh, Coca-Cola is obviously a successful brand and it speaks to money and power. Warhol is quoted as saying, what's great about this country is that America started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same thing as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola and you know that the president drinks Coca-Cola, Liz Taylor drinks Coca-Cola and just think, you can drink Coca-Cola too. A Coke is a Coke. And no amount of money can get you a better Coke from the one the bum on the corner is drinking. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. Liz Taylor knows it, the President knows it, the bum knows it, and you know it. Okay, so in a sense, this work is also about social class, capitalism, and fame. It's kind of bringing everyone to the same level. Okay, everyone can afford this Coke, everyone can view this artwork, you don't need to have a higher degree, a doctorate's degree in fine arts. To interpret it um, yeah so that's what it's about there's a neighbor's kid enjoying some free time outside so if you hear noises it's not me okay some bottles might be slightly different but they all taste exactly the same and may be consumed by absolutely anyone regardless of their social standing okay the next work we look at by Warhol is a little bit gruesome okay it's called five deaths twice one red car crash okay and it really speaks about how we become desensitized due to the media we see the same images over and over and over and you kind of just become used to it you you know if you think of for example when the protests were happening in south africa recently and there was that video of the girl that was um trying to escape a burning building and her family threw her down and sorry if you know it and she was caught by complete random strangers. The first time you saw that image, it was like, oh, so powerfully moving, but it becomes repeated and repeated and repeated, and you're just like, oh yeah, that was an, a memory of the protest. But the severity of the human impact, the first time you saw it kind of disappears. Okay, so here the violence of the disaster or a car crash is filtered through an indifferent silkscreen reproduction. Just as violence in mass media is indifferent and desensitized. The image represents the cold and impersonal views of an uninvolved spectator. The more sensational things are repeated in the media, the more we get used to them until we become so numb and indifferent towards shocking scenes. Um, he treated heroes and heroines just as indifferent um, as death and disaster. It provides insight into the nature and effects of mainstream media. So pop is for everyone, he said. I don't think art should be only for the selected few. I think it should be for the mass of American people. He creates images of the macabre in a mechanized way in order to sell um, or call attention to the manner in which the media can make things become insignificant through repetition. Okay, um, it's also speaking about um, the macabre being something that's really gruesome, but how we have this... Um, sensationalized view of death how you can't not look away um, yeah it's just part of humanity you know if you see a car crash it's hard not to look 
So it speaks to that as well. I just want to go back to the Marilyn artwork, um, the Marilyn series. So this artwork, uh, Warhol's artwork of Marilyn Monroe, was created in 1967. Okay, she had died five years before that at the age of 36 because she overdosed on barbiturates. Okay, whatever that was. But apparently it was, at the time, people thought it was probably a suicide um, because she had been, yeah, just, you know, her life, she shot to fame at a young age and it was just kind of overwhelming. So to think that he could create this artwork of her five years after her death, if you think of when famous people die and how their images are repeated, 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 this was also part of the concept of the time, okay? So, I want you to look at the simplified um, line work that he uses, the simplified shapes and tones, and this will become important for your exam. So look at the techniques of silkscreen, simplification, which we call stylization in art, when things become almost like um, vector images, they become black and white, almost like a logo as opposed to a highly detailed artwork. Um, and look at the bright colors he's used. Look at the use of popular culture and media. I'm going to have to move because this guy is really eating next door. Um, anyway, let me see how far I can get. Okay. Let me try the next room. Here we go. On a trip. Okay, I think it'll be better here. All right, so... Consumerism, let me just close this door, sorry. Now you'll probably hear the cats meowing because they want to come in. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not going to go through further examples of artists. You're welcome to read through them. If you study Hamilton and Andy Warhol, you will be fine. I just want you to emphasize the key points of pop art, okay, to equate low art and high art and appeal to all people, okay, which makes it very postmodern because it's not elitist. It's looking at using things from mass media and bringing them into art, which is also very postmodern. It's looking at using things like comic books, advertisements, celebrities, um, media, all of that, and bringing it into the art world. It's looking at creating almost like a mechanized, creating art like a machine. So replicating print media in art creation. So you're taking away from art that idea that everyone needs to be skilled and proficient in a specific medium. Okay, and then the the last thing I want you to look at is definitely that this idea of consumerism, the American ideal. Okay, so pop art is very Americanized. Even if the artists weren't from America originally, they really created art that spoke to American freedom and liberalism and capitalism. Um, yes, so, sorry this video is a bit longer than I thought it would be. Um, good luck, I'm thinking of you, and let me know if anyone has, an, oh well, if you had an issue watching the video you would not have watched up until this point. <laughs> um, yeah, so ignore what I was about to say there. I hope you have a good exam. Thinking of you, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, bye.